All right, everyone. How's it going? All right, so today we're going to, first of all, uh, all my courses are on sale, 25% off. Some of you guys had said to me, and I didn't really realize this, that some of my courses were, um, you can only buy one at 25%. So I've changed that, so any courses of mine through my website is 25% off. And today I'm talking about, um, oh, we got Phil, as always, Phil Mingan, running the, uh, the chat. Thanks so much, Phil, and everybody's here. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what I'm doing. I'm talking about Billy Gibbons. And, you know, I, it, it sounds a lot like, well, the first of all, I want to say thank you very much to David Grissom for letting me use his track. Uh, so David, as you guys know, is a really good friend of mine. And so it's so funny when I start to play, I texted him earlier, and I, I like, when I try to do some Billy Gibbons stuff, I end up sounding like you. <laughs> so I'm a big fan of David's. Um, so I'm also a huge fan of Billy Gibbons. And the idea that I want to start mixing in is the hybrid picking stuff. And I learned it uh, early on from some of the, the Billy Gibbons things. And some of the reasons why I can't honestly play along with Billy Gibbons tracks is that they'll, they might just shut down my video. So I can show you the ideas and what songs that they come from, but I can't actually just show you them on YouTube or else I might get demonetized or all that kind of stuff. So the concepts are all the same. And at Truefire, I do have a play in the style of Billy Gibbons course, and there's lots of good stuff on there. And uh, I see some of you guys already have that. So, um, uh, so let's, let's talk about some of those ideas. First thing is the hybrid pick. I'm mostly playing in, in B. So I'm playing a B minor pentatonic scale, a B, B minor blues scale. So let's talk about using this middle finger here. And that's what I'm using. Sorry to give you guys the finger. Um, the first lick that I got from basically Blue Jean Blues, which is in a B minor blues. Right, this sort of sound. One thing that Billy Gibbons does quite a bit, I touched on it last week in a lockdown where you can use your open strings. But here, if we're in a key of B, I'm going to use my open B string. So I have a B minor pentatonic. It's a B minor blues. Which is a great key to play the blues in because you have that sound. It's almost like Jeff Beck when we love you. Which is in F, but F sharp. So here's the idea. I'm going to play the B minor blues scale. Right? But I'm going to use my middle finger and I'm going to hybrid pick and play my B string. Right? So I have that. And, and Blue Jean Blues, he does kind of like it. So that was one of the first times I'd heard that, and I was like, what, what is that? That's so thick and cool sounding, and very much uh, like a lot of stuff that, uh, that Billy does. But I never knew that you could use, I, never, I, I had not thought about, well, why can't I use the B strings? I'm using the root of this, the key that I'm in. Right, so I'm playing B, D, E, uh, there's my F. So I can start to expand on that. Right, so I'm going to play a B minor blues scale, and each note I'm going to play with my middle finger, I'm going to play a B string. Right, so it's a really cool, thick sound. Sounds great with it, with even a lot of gain, you know. Right, that's a super great sound. And it does sound like David, and if you're watching David, what's up, man? Um, so Blue Jean Blues is the first time I'd heard that. Um, and the other thing, if we just kind of go on 
on just that idea of using your open string. Last week we talked about open E, right? Well, I did the same kind of thing. I'm just going to play my E string on top. So I'm saying E minor blues. And you're going to play the open E in there. It's like Hey Joe, right? Little uh, uh, Lightning Hopkins, all those guys. But Billy put on, obviously, the overdrive with it, and that's great sound. So then I can go to the one chord to a five chord in blues. Check that out, guys. Right, so I'm thinking, like, you know, on a blues. It's live. did there, so I went from my uh, one chord to my five chord to the B in the B to my A, or at no third. That's a really cool. Uh, and Clapton does that. Another place where I first heard something like this um, is in Ramblin' on My Mind off of the Blues Breakers record. So he does that... Uh, So he plays the B chord, the B note on the five chord, and you open B string together. And he plays the A, and he doesn't play the third, because we put in the third, it gets very bright sounding, and we have this open kind of sound. So here it is, once again, the idea is to let these open strings ring. Right, and so if I'm in the key of B, Great, super thick sound. I can play it all day. Um, now, also, let's just uh, run on the idea once again. The key of G provides us with an open string, right? So we can play a G minor pentatonic scale. And here in my part, th this is where it ends up really sounding like David. And let's play the open G string. So like... It's the same exact lick, right? I'm playing a blues scale. But it's going to open G in there. Um, so in, in, say, something like Cheap Sunglasses in the chorus, he's playing the F and uh, the G, and he plays open D string in using. So he gets this big power chord, G and D, then the C and G. So you get that great. And the open strings have a real distinctive quality to them. They're really thick and, and, and awesome sounding. So, uh, B, G, right, C, you get that, that C, uh, the G and the C, so it's the fifth, but one thing you don't really want to do, if you want to get it to sound like Billy, or, or uh, even more so like David, is to not add in the third, it sounds very bright, you know, you want to play Blackbird or something like that, so that sounds super bright, so I'm just going to use the fifth, or the root. So uh, Billy does that in, in Cheap Sunglasses. He also does in Sharp Dressed Man. Like, uh, that kind of thing. 
lets that ring out. So getting that open G string, thinking G major, a G minor pentatonic. All right, so that's some really cool stuff. And you can move that up around the neck. So say we're back to B. All right, so I'm just using that open B string and playing a B minor pentatonic scale. Don't play that G. It's an awesome sound. You could do it in E. Right, so we've got. And E, we could use the B string because it's the fifth. That's pretty, pretty cool. Now, one of the first hybrid picking, this is hybrid picking, but one lick that I, was, that I learned from Billy Gibbons right off the bat was in um, I'm Bad I'm Nationwide, where he does that kind of a... Uh, that move right there. Um, that was a big deal for me. And I remember um, you seeing the... I was like you know, trying to do this when I was younger and trying to play those as not as hybrid picking and I, and I had no idea what was going on. And I remember seeing the really awesome live in the Rock Palace video. Uh, it's about 82, 83. Um, we're in bowler hats, like it's before they really hit big. Um, and that was, that's my favorite period of the first five, six records. So um, we've got this. Uh, and then here's what I'm gonna do with the, uh, using my middle finger and my pick, or I might actually use my middle finger and my ring finger and pick. Now this is the, the crazy one. So we have an octave of B and B, and I'm just going to go back and forth. Pick, middle, pick, middle. So that was one of those first things I'm like, wow, that's hybrid picking that doesn't sound like chicken picking to me. Not that there's anything wrong with chicken picking, it's just I don't, you know, not really a country guitarist in any stretch of the imagination. And so it, it was just a way to use this stuff or I wanted to know what he was doing. So when I got really into him, I started to realize, wow, this guy does this all the time. Uh, the Rock Palace was 1980. Thank you, Rainier. I couldn't remember. All right, so 1980. So that... That was really cool. And the other lick I got from that video, same song too, where he does, he goes down like, you know, uh, is this. And this is a Jeff Beck. I've heard Jeff Beck do this quite a bit. Um, it, this is a really excellent getting into uh, hybrid picking lick. So it's just thinking, I'm thinking B minor pentatonic, though I am adding in this uh, G sharp, which is not in B minor pentatonic, but still sounds good. So I'm going to play B. I'm going to bar across that seventh fret for the D and the G string. So I'm going to get the D note, the G, and the B string. Let's call them notes. D and F sharp. So I have B. Flatten out that third finger. Back down. Back up. So somebody's just asking right now, would you have any exercises for practicing hybrid picking? This was the one that got me into it. And Jeff Beck does it, like I said, um, that was one of, I don't want to say older licks, but he, you know, in, this, in the 70s, you hear him play that lick a lot. I can't remember what tunes that it's in, but it's, he's definitely using that one. So now, once again. <laughs> back and forth as quickly as you can. You just kind of build it up slowly. Now, um, I mean this with the all due respect, because Billy Gibbons is one of my absolute favorite guitar players, is sometimes it doesn't matter how clean you get it. It's not about how clean, like, man, I'm totally nailing this, you know, like, you know, at you know, 150 on the metronome or something like that. It's just as it does it groove is the most important thing. So if you've got like, you know, know, 
course, it's in time, but um, and it's clean, but uh, you, you just want it to sound cool. That's <laughs> the thing I'm saying. And that's a big country lick here. Danny Gatton played that a lot, like those kind of licks. Now, this is for minor, but if you want to make it major, and this is what I've heard Beck do. A little trickier to play. So I'm playing a B major triad, B, F sharp, sorry, B, D sharp, and F sharp. I'm going to flatten out the third finger. And back. And this is all I did. See, that's really, that's difficult. Now, Beck doesn't use a pick, and I find that sometimes easier. Because uh, it's more direct for me, uh, using the pick and these two fingers. On something really fast like that, I still have a little bit of a problem getting it to exactly where I want. But, so depending how clean I want it, uh, you know, live, I might do whatever. Sounds cool, but... Is how Beck would do it because he doesn't use a pick. So, minor, major. So that's a really good exercise. So um, the next one, I just wanted to throw out a few of the ones, and this is, I stole this from uh, Lagrange, right? So we didn't see. And he's doing, uh, I'll stay in B though, because we have. Right, so I'm going back and forth between. So we have G and B flat, right? And uh, I might slide up in each downbeat. And just back and forth. That's another excellent exercise. Right, so now this lick. There's another cool one. Sounds in New York here, the siren. Okay, so we've got my G and B flat. I'm gonna go back down, and I have my F and my A. Sorry, I'm in the wrong key. I got thrown off. The siren. All right, so it's F sharp. I was like, what are those notes aren't in the key of B? All right, so I have F sharp, an A, E, and G sharp, and then I'm gonna borrow with my first finger right there. And I have, so like, bring that down. really started off the hybrid picking for me. That lick, right? And he just goes on it forever, and it just sounds freaking awesome. And uh, that was another one that really opened up the door for me. For i got to start digging into this. And I realized, um, it was pretty funny, um, just on the side, I didn't realize how much I had internalized the hybrid picking until I was at True Fire. And I was watching back some of my videos, and I was like, wow, I didn't, I didn't realize how much I'd internalized it into my guitar playing. I can't imagine playing guitar without hybrid picking at this point. When I'm talking about hybrid picking, I'm not really talking about like chicken picking um, in a country sense, because those are different kind of skill set or chops. I'm just talking about the idea of using mixing your pick and finger. So let's just get to some nitty gritty stuff. I'm using um, the Diodario Black Ice Pick right? And that's just a little bit larger than a Jazz 3, but it's about the same size. So for me, I prefer this size pick, especially with hybrid picking. Now, you know, everybody's mileage may vary as to what pick they like to use. So I personally like the Jazz 3s. I like these because they're a little, a little bit bigger than a Jazz 3, just a hair, but I find I don't drop them. Like Jazz 3s I have a hard time holding on to. This is the Black Ice by Diodario, 1.5 millimeter. Um, love this pick. It's my, my favorite pick. 
And then um, I just find this size allows me to, to hybrid pick a little easier. So so right there, once again, that lick, the, the B, ring finger and middle finger is going to play the D and the G, the D and the F sharp note, excuse me. Then I'm going to just flatten out the third finger. There's all, there's all sorts of ways you can go really way deeper into this. And since I've been mentioning David Grissom a lot, because uh, I owe a lot to David for this sound as well, and um, it was actually pretty f funny. I'd never heard of David in years and years, uh, years and years ago. The National Guitar Summer Workshop, he was a guest artist, and he started playing, and we, we usually, in the afternoon, they'd do a clinic, and in the evening, we'd jam with the guest artist. And he came out, and he was just warming up or sound checking. And I was like, what is going on? Like, what is that sound? Um, and part of the sound was this. And I was like, you know, it was that big, super huge sound. And somebody kind of mentioned Austin. Yeah, you hear like Eric Johnson doing this. Um, it was a real rootsy rock sound. And for me, coming from more of a shredder background, I was really intrigued by it. And I always loved ZZ Top. And that was before I'd actually gotten into it. And I kind of made that connection at that point, and I think David had spoken about Billy Gibbons, and I was like, at that point, w being the age, uh, you know, ZZ Top was having all the big hits on MTV, which isn't my favorite period. But a lot of those tunes, if you... Uh, I'm, I saw Billy play a bunch, and he played Sharp Dressed Man without the, the synths and stuff. And it was really awesome. So, you know, the great songs... Um, but sometimes those, you, you know, you're thinking about the car videos and MTV. I'm showing my age. So I turned, to, I didn't really listen to that. Then I got back into them again. Uh, the early stuff in my early 30s, maybe, late 20s. So it was about two years ago. And um, I was really, I was shocked at like how much I had missed. And a lot of it was this right hand stuff. And I was like, man, I got to just dig back into this. And the subtleties that Billy Gibbons has got when he plays are just the best. I mean, um, getting the uh, the dynamics from the guitar and using a lot of your fingers for that. Okay, so... So another lick, so we're doing this one, right? So if we look at our notes, and this is a really cool thing to think about, F sharp and A, do an octave below, and it sounds awesome. I think he does that in the Bad Nationwide. Like... anywhere. Right, so it's a really uh, just that back and forth. Now you can do also just, I did double stops before, you just do single notes. Okay, now a little guitar player trick. If I'm going to do a, a quick that right and that's a little sloppy to get that super clean if I'm not doing double stop but if I'm doing two single notes I'll change up fingers I'll do like or you know so I can get sometimes that's really hard to do to get that if you're at a really high tempo so I might change out a finger and see now I'm doing it so fast that not so fast but hard to keep that tempo up. Now, another thing I'm just noticing. For me, I like to have my nails a little longer in this hand, but right now, you know, like you realize one day, oh, I got to cut my nails. Um, it's a little long, and I'm catching the corner of my finger, my nail on the string, so I would want to bring them down a little bit. I like the nails a little long, because, you know, for I just like... <laughs> I just kind of got a little nail sometimes when I play. Um, all right, so. Right, and then. It's a cool thing that he does quite a bit. So there, starting to mix the hybrid picking with the ring finger. And in that B string. Right? 
right? So putting that all together. And it's just really basically pentatonic. Now, um, I would always suggest learning the tunes. And of course, uh, over at True Fire or through my website, I have my play in the style of Billy Gibbons where I go into depth on a lot of these things and uh, go, go deeper on this. And there's 25% off if you want to check that out. I like that course a lot. It was, uh, I learned a lot about him by doing that course. I was a fan and I dug really deep in. And there's so many subtleties in the rhythm guitar parts and digging into the early records and just was really, was really fun. Now, one other look that I remember that I played off the top, and this is actually, I think I first heard it from my buddy Guy, but it's pretty common. Here's Steve Ray Vaughan play this thing, but... So I'm still sticking to B minor, and I have a B minor blues scale. So I'm going to play B, D, E, there's my F, and there's my F sharp. I'm just going to bar across the top. And what I'm going to do is play, my pinky's going to grab the F. So the same thing as doing it in E, right? But we're going to bar and, and transpose up to F. Right, so this. There's that note. Okay, so... Um, those are some of those Billy Gibbons hybrid picking uh, ideas. And uh, since, like I said, I, I, I feel remiss, because sometimes when I do this stuff, I, I'm, you got this big guitar sound. It starts to sound a lot like David. So I highly recommend, David's got two True Fire courses that are great. Um, open Road, the Open Road is the series, an Open Road Blues, and there's an Open Road just where he talks about his general guitar playing, and, um, and this track is from that. He let me let me use it, and like I said, and he really has taken some of these nuggets and just made them all his own and brought it to this other level. Um, so I highly recommend anything that he does, of course, because he's awesome. Um, all right, so, oh, someone's asking here too. What about pinch harmonics? Well, you know, the, the funny thing is like, with Billy, like, it's, I don't say that a trick, you know, but it's one thing he does, and you just, you're grabbing those pinch harmonics. That was Phil asking. Let me get that gain. So you get that pinch harmonic, you know, by grabbing the pick really tight, works on a down pick, and then you can move your pick along the strings to get different notes. Right, so then he's just kind of going on that. So you can go on the blues scale. Kind of bending each note. And then I can also move the pick. Right, so that's the, the pick harmonic, uh, the pinch harmonic thing. So, um, other stuff that I got from him that way too. But so the main, not the main thing, I would highly recommend going back to the first four, five ZZ Top records. He's, I always, he's not the, I'm, please take this the right way because sometimes you say something on the internet that's live and people like get jump on you. Take this the right way. He's one of my favorite guitar players all the time. And back then he was just astoundingly good. And um, he's still great. But back then, like a lot of these people, you know, he was younger and he was just, they were on fire. The band was touring all the time. They were, you know, firing all cylinders, that kind of thing. And man, shockingly good. Just so good. Uh, and then there's a bunch of things on YouTube. If you just search like ZZ Top Live in the 70s, there's so many cool bootlegs. Of course, you have to deal with bootleg quality. But it's just so good. And them at their, at their peak of just kicking ass. Um, and that great doc really fun documentary on Netflix, if you want to watch that on ZZ Top, too. I highly recommend that. Um, so uh, I'll get to questions in a second. So uh, the first record, ZZ Top's first record, man, he is really great on that. Oh, he's great on all this stuff. Uh, Tres Ombres would probably be, if you're just kind of digging in, like I don't have a lot of experience, Trace Ombres would be... 
I would say the the one to grab. I mean, you know, it's got all the great tunes on it. I think top to bottom, that's a great record. Um, Rio Grande Mud, uh, all of them. Z Top's first record was one of the later ones that I came to. The first record, obviously, but I came to it kind of later, um, and that was that was really cool. So, all right, let me get to some questions. Um, so the first thing that somebody was asking about was just amps. So let me just talk about that for just a sec. Um, I'm actually playing through my Two Rock Bloomfield drive. How bitching it, they can get it to sound like that, huh? Um, I also have a Marshall behind me, uh, the Super Lead, that uh, 71. It's, it needs a little loving right now. Um, I can make a ZZ Top reference. Um, but uh, the, the Bloomfield Drive was killing. And that Marshall Origin, if you guys checked that I was using last week, it get gets you right into that ballpark, especially that first record. Um, Les Paul, as you can tell, with the humbuckers, that's a big part of the sound. Um, and when you listen to those early records, he'd switch guitars a lot, but those live recordings, it's, you know, the Pearly Gates through a Marshall, and that's one of those consummately great, uh, like, darker Marshall tones that's similar to more like Eric Clapton than, say, you know, something a little later like Eddie Van Halen, which more of a, a bright, uh, upfront Marshall sound in Billy's early stuff. So, a few little things, and he's always very mysterious about what he used, and there's a good book that he has, um, about cars and gear, and he talks about what amps and guitars he used on certain recordings. Uh, but live was almost always the Marshall and the uh, the Les Paul. Um, I was going to see some other point about the oh, someone's asking about like fuzz. Sometimes he sounds like he's using a fuzz. I, I'll check through the questions of that. Um, sometimes he was. Sometimes he was just using a, a tweed deluxe, like uh, down brownie. I suppose like a tweed brown. Tweed Deluxe. Um, so sometimes those get a little more fuzzy sounding. So I'm not exactly sure. I'm not a historian on his, on his stuff. Just, But sometimes it gets a little fuzzy. So if I want to use a fuzz, I'll use a Marshall. I mean, I'll use a fuzz pedal. And sometimes if you over crank a Marshall, because amps have a sweet spot in where they can live, if you overdrive a Marshall, like over overdrive it too much, they can get a little fuzzy too. A lot of amps just go past where their optimum thing is. So maybe you guys maybe do or don't know that. Um, if you have like a 100 watt super lead, it, if you dime everything, sometimes that's just too much and the amp just starts to kind of uh, go past its where you need it to be. Um, so tube amps, you know, as you notice probably at home, if you got a tube amp, you turn it up, it gets louder, it gets louder, and then suddenly it doesn't get that much louder, it just gets more distorted, right? So if you get to this point where you're just cranking it and cranking it to where it's all the way on 10, Sometimes it's just pushing the amp a little too hard and maybe it doesn't hold together as much. So that's uh, something to think about. Oh, yeah. Okay, so Phil, you were talking about the remasters. Or S.E. Nesbitt. Yes, S.E. Nesbitt. Sorry, man. Um, yeah, be sure you get, especially for the old records, I'm so glad you brought that up, man. The, ori the, the remasters of the original recordings, because in the 80s they redid everything with uh, new drums, like synth drums, and... Um, those are the ones you probably grew up listening to. It's not bad, but when you hear the original recordings with real live drums, uh, I think it sounds much cooler. It sounds like a band. It doesn't, it's not those drum samples, which uh, I find a little distracting. Because once you listen to the old versions, and then you put on the new, that period in the 90s or 80s where they re-released them, it's, like, it, it's hard to listen to because it sounds like that period. Okay. Um, do you have any questions? Any questions, guys? Um... All right. I guess you're just so mesmerized by me talking about Billy Gibbons. <laughs> All right, I'll do the roll call. Uh, I got some new people here today. Thanks. Oh, um, for everybody who came through 5 Watt World uh, with Keith Williams, thanks so much. We have a, a new video coming out, uh, Bino on a Budget, which was fun. We talked a little bit about that uh, last week using the Marshall Origin, and uh, that's going to be coming out soon. Uh, putting that together, it's going to be a ton of fun, so... Um, check that one out. And thank you for anybody who's coming here from from uh, uh, Keith and Five Watt World. Thanks, guys. Um, Grandpa Bob, Matt Gibson. What's up, Matt? Graham Ross, Nessie Nesbitt. Ultimate, ultimate. I like that. Um, t <laughs> dear Tone, you are delicious. Love me. <laughs> Smooch Jones. Um, I like that. Smooch Jones. 
Uh, Richard and Sarah. Jeffrey Reed, what's up, Jeff? Yusef Kasim, Baby John, Mason Patton. Um, yeah, guys, thanks for coming in. All right. Go down the bottom. Which ZZ Top video girl do I like the best? I don't know. The one that had the legs. I like that. Okay. Um, if I met Billy Gibbons, what would be the one question I'd ask him? Uh, how you doing? <laughs> uh, you know, it's a funny thing about me and me and Billy Gibbons. Like all my friends, not all, a lot of my friends have met him. Because he's always around New York when he comes in. He goes to all the guitar stores. And it's just so funny. Like a lot of my friends are like, oh, Billy Gibbons just left. I'm like, and a number of my friends know him personally. And it's just one of those things where we've crossed paths a bunch of times. Oh, Billy just left. Did you see Billy on the way out? And I'm like, no, I don't know him. I'm not on a first-name basis. I haven't met him. And I know a bunch of people who've, who've uh, met him randomly. And they all, like, oh, I just assumed you knew, you, you knew him. Because we all met him and know him. So... Uh, heard nothing but amazingly cool stuff about the guy, as you can tell. Okay, so, um, did Billy Gibbons take some stuff from Freddie King? Everybody took stuff from Freddie King, whether they know it or not. I would say so. I mean, he is, um, he's a real music historian, which is really cool. If you listen to, oh, um, I don't know if you can still hear it. It's on, um, uh, Who's that podcaster guy? Oh, he's a great one with Billy Gibbons. I know it really narrows it down. Famous comedian. Oh, this rant like rants in the beginning. His name just popped out of my head right now. Anyway, that was really lame for me to bring that up and not remember who I'm talking about. Uh, uh, okay, so um, did you get a new pooch? I did get a new dog. Yes, we did. Yeah, and he's downstairs and he's an absolute terror. He's awesome. But um, he will not stop harassing my other dog, Stanley. And Stanley's uh, being very patient. Um, all right. Um, what ZZ Top tunes do you enjoy playing the most? It's not Joe Rogan, man. It's Mark Maron. Thank you, Chris Cram. Yes, Mark Maron. Thank you. This great interview with Mark Maron. And he's just a, like, he's a total historian about music. And it's really fascinating to hear him speak. And yeah. All right. Um, what CC Top song do you enjoy playing? I don't know. I love Cheap Sunglasses. That's one of my favorites. Just absolutely love my, uh, that whole period. So it's a lot of those. Um, Neighbor Neighbor is one of my favorite tunes by them off of the early, off of the first record. So lots of really good stuff. You know, and he used, uh, right, he uses light strings, sevens, um, so that's one of those interesting things where it, it depends on how much gain you're getting from your amp, right? Because he's using, basically live, he's been using that Marshall preamp uh, that I had in the, in the 80s, and who knew that that's what he was using. So he's actually just pushing through, so he can get away with using the lighter strings um, in the sense of uh, um, if you set your amp and things like that up for it, you can you can do that. I did see him play a few times where he was just plugging in, he was sitting in, and he just plugged in. And you could tell he was like, oh boy, you know, he sounded great, but you know, when you don't have that, that much gain, you're like, oh no, <laughs> you know, the gain's dropping off. So um, it, can be, it can be difficult for sure. Okay, um, have I ever tried the Expandora? Um, no, no, I didn't, I haven't tried that. You know, and, and we all know that a lot of times he just has, he pulls people's legs. Like that, that one in the 90s, he had a, like this, like, 10 expandors in a row like he doesn't he didn't do that you know like he was just having fun with people so it's uh, his sense of humor is awesome um okay uh what's the longest you've gone without playing guitar you're on holiday right now uh i don't know a week on vacation i think it's sometimes kind of cool to step away from it uh and then you come back fresh i mean you you might not feel that great you know physically playing but you come back and um, you, uh, it feels really good. It's, it's exciting, you know, like it just, you're playing like, yeah, everything sounds great. So it's nice to renew that. The worst is, I think I was away for longer than that. Like, I'm not bringing a guitar. And I was miserable because I just felt my calluses going away. And that's the only thing that drives me crazy. 
So if I'm on vacation, I don't practice seriously. I might just bring like a guitar to just noodle to keep the fingers going. And but I don't take it seriously. I I, I like to step away from it for a little bit. Um, you pay for it a little bit, you know, afterwards. But whatever. Life is more important than having your chops perfectly all the time. Um, hey, where does the raw power of Billy Gibbons come from? Yeah, I don't know, man. He's just the sh he's the shit, right? Yeah, he's just he's just. There's so much energy when he plays, and that sound is so big, and that really, like, that wall of guitar sound, that Les Paul and that Marshall, especially in the early stuff, just just a great player. And you can hear where it comes from. Like I said, the real historian. Oh, for instance, one thing I heard, I learned this from him. Another thing that he taught me, um, he was talking about when they did, like, you know, Dust My Broom, and he never wanted to do it because he never had it to sound right. And I just saw a video on YouTube where it's just going... <laughs> And he's talking about that intro, which you can go like, doesn't sound right. And I talked about a video where he said, well, you got to think Elmore James, when he did it, was using his fingers, not a pick, and he was just doing an upstroke with the middle finger. And that was the trick. And then he said, that, and suddenly it sounded right, and that's exactly what I'm doing here. So that's one thing I learned from him. On a YouTube video. <laughs> so using that middle finger like that. Um, okay. Uh, what kind of strings do I use? These are D'Addario 10 through uh, 42. Regular, regular old 10 XL set. I've been using them forever and ever. I use the same set of strings on my on my uh, strats as I do in my Les Pauls. I know a lot of people say, why do you do that? It's just easier. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just used to them. I've tried 11s on a Les Paul, and I'm always miserable. I I, I sometimes have hand problems, and then have had prob have had hand problems, and still sometimes get them. Um, just just uh, occupational hazard. You know what I mean? You're anything you overdo, you know, not designed to be putting in the work like that. So um, I tried heavier strings, and it just doesn't work for me. I'm not a really big guy, and so I don't. I used to kind of like, oh, I got to play super heavy strings. I don't care anymore. I mean, if I, if I went to nights, I, I like, uh, you know, Rick, Bi Rick Bi did a whole thing on string gauges. That's for, like, recording, and um, I've tried lighter string gauges. I just have a hard time because I sometimes play a little harder, and especially live. Um, they, they just move too much, and I don't like the feel of them. But it's pretty funny. During COVID, a number of my friends, have, we talked about, like, they've gone to, my friends who use 11s, Sometimes you're going to like ten and a halfs or tens because you're not gigging as much, and that's hard to keep the hand strength going up if you're not really playing. Because playing at home is one thing, but being on a gig, you play a lot harder. And when I go on a gig and I have a lighter set of strings on, I, I something feels wrong. I don't. I get too into it, and everything feels too loosey goosey, so I can't play them. I could get used to it, I guess. You know. Um, what else? Do you have any special exercise practice for hybrid, hybrid picking? Yeah, well, I talked about it earlier, but I'll be happy to talk about it again. If you just take, I mean, just say like B minor pentonic. Or actually, how about this? Like, and just start moving the between the two fingers. Right? And then you can double stop. That was the first big one for me. And then also, totally on the left thing, um, Eric Johnson, Austin City Limits, the big one. At one point, he went like a... He did that kind of a lick. You like close the Dover kind of thing. That kind of thing. So where I'm just taking E minor pentatonic, let's say make it minor. And I'm just going to alternate between the thumb and the pick. And what I do is might mute that, that E a little bit. I haven't worked on this lick in a little bit. Then you can do it. This is a tougher one. You get your thumb in the bottom. That's definitely a... Uh, that 
that's definitely something that Dave would do. Or, or Eric Johnson. That <laughs> Hendrix, too, like that, you know, uh, see it sounds like a Les Paul, but like that, Killing Floor, like. So you get this. That thumb playing those two notes, so you just play them individually. So this is just um, more lead based as opposed to rhythm guitar based where we could talk about that in another break lockdown. But it all started all that kind of. All those kind of mixed hybrid picking and picking uh, all started with for me. Right, just that. That was the first thing. So I would say that to start to start you off. Oh, wow, we got a lot of people jumped on. Hey, everybody! Thanks for joining. Um, I think my battery's running down. So at one point, my if just let me know if my my thing dies. I've got I think I got some more batteries here. I didn't I didn't check my battery life. So got some batteries. And if you're like me, <laughs> I got like four sets of batteries here. I think these are good. If not, I'll f we'll find out. So if this goes dead, Phil, you got need to just tell me that my suddenly you can't hear me anymore. Okay, uh, some more questions. Um, do I use any type of nail hardener? Uh, no, I don't really use my nails enough for that. You know, um, I just kind of keep them a little long. I've been trimming them lower and lower because I don't use them as much as I used to. And my first finger, especially when I'm on the road, the nail on my first finger starts to get really thin because obviously I, I scratch it on the strings, so it starts to thin out a little bit. Sometimes I can feel that nail just rubbing there, so it gets pretty thin. I've had a break on the road, and um, so yeah. Uh, what are your weaknesses playing the guitar, if I have any? I've got no weaknesses, man. <laughs> I think I think I have... And I, look, we, we're, I think I talked about this in this thing about guitar a while ago. We're all the same at any level, man. Like, I very uh, I, I cringe when I hear myself play back. I just try to plow through it. But, you know, um, you just keep going, and you, I feel like I've gotten better. I can watch. I, I have a hard time watching any of my True Fire courses because I feel like I just play better, and that's an odd playing situation. Um, but what do I, I, I want to work on everything. I feel like uh, everything. So my weaknesses, what are my weaknesses? If we're talking about the genres I play, like, okay, like playing jazz is a weakness for me, but I don't care to play jazz. You know, I'm just not really, a, I don't have the love to be a super jazz guitar player. Uh, for me, okay, yeah, let's do it. Um, my rhythm guitar playing when I was on the road with Robin. That, to me, that kicked my ass from brutally because he's like one of the, f the, in my mind, maybe the best rhythm guitar player ever. Absolutely. Just can't, d just the stuff he plays, especially when you're hanging out and you're playing with him, like, jeez, like, what? And his rhythmic feel, and it's just it's so good. And so he would solo, and I would have to play rhythm guitar, and I would be like, oh my God, like, he must, this has got to be difficult for him. And I'm, a, I, I'm an experienced guitar player, so my rhythm guitar, nobody's ever said to me, hey, you got to work on your rhythm guitar playing until I played with Robin Ford. And he said, you got to work on your rhythm guitar playing. And I was like, yeah, I do, especially playing with you. And then he, when you have some, oh, that kind of guy playing behind you, um, that was one thing that was really brought it to the forefront for me that, man, like I have overlooked this this kind of guitar playing. So that's one thing that I'm trying to work on uh, myself is to get to be a better rhythm guitar player. Um, and I, I mean, not rhythm guitar player, like playing a song, you know. I mean, just backing someone up in an improvisatory way and then just listening to way that you can keep it exciting, but yet not get obtrusive um, or intrusive, I should say. And that's one of the things that, that uh, really I learned from him. Painfully so. You know, with the stink eye at times. Like, 
come on, man, give me some more. And you're like, oh, okay. And then, you know, there's all these things of trying to figure out what he wants as a band leader and all those kind of things. But as a, that would be my biggest, that's for me, it's, it's working on, uh, on um, rhythm guitar playing, especially when you, when you get the absolute uh, honor to play with someone like him. You, you learn really fast, like, oh, wow. <laughs> not, that I thought, <laughs> not that I thought I was as good as Robin. I don't mean it that way, but when you get your ass handed to you like that on a stage, which I love, feels, doesn't feel good at the time, but that's the way you get better, man. You know, that's the, that's the, the coolest thing. And at one point, we did a gig, I think it was a second gig. He's like, all right, Jeff's got this song by himself. And he just walked off the stage. I was like, I do, you know, so, you know, trial by fire and we laughed about it afterwards and it was awesome. But that being able to hold it all together like that. Um, okay. That's my big, that, that's one of my weaknesses. Plenty of other ones. Okay. You know what? I'll give you a few more. My ear, it's getting better. I still work on my ear. Um, what's been really cool. I don't know why this is happening. It just is happening. Um, I was watching, I was binge watching Westworld season three because I hadn't seen season three. And I always have a guitar in my lap when I'm watching TV and I'm hearing things that I didn't hear before. Like I knew what key and I just grabbed the guitar immediately or if it didn't have it, like that sounds like it's in B minor and I would just sit down and play the line and I've been getting so much better at that lately. Um, so I find that my ears have always been a bit of a problem. Uh, especially in a pressure situation. You know, when someone's like, oh man, it just goes like, or you know, or like you know, the line is, you know, come on, get that. You got it, right? Just and you're like, wait, what? You know, so things have gotten better, or even just a, a basic melody. So, um, like I said, in, in Westworld, they, you know, they've just some melodies. I just tried to grab any melody that was going on on the show. Obviously, I was watching it alone, or else anybody else would be like, would you shut up? You know, so. Okay. Hey, Keith, what's up, man? Uh, Keith, Keith Williams in the house. Uh, hey, thanks everybody who watched the, uh, the JTM45 video. That one became a nice big success. That was a ton of fun. And we got some cool stuff coming out. The, the Beano on a Budget is going to be coming out soon. Um, what else do we have? Uh, any advice on how to keep a, a boogie groove steady? Oh, like... Uh, Shake your hips, hip shake, Lagrange, tons of tunes. Um, yeah, keeping this hand going. That was terrible. I was thinking about looking good, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. What is that? You know, from uh, Magic Sam. Yeah, I'm trying to do that with a pick. He's not doing the pick. I'm off on a tangent. Let me try to get that. All right, so I'm, I'm off on a tangent in my own head. Sorry, guys. You saw where I go, like woo. So here, it's this right hand, and I'm doing these ups. I wouldn't try that tempo to do with hybrid picking, like in the beginning of Grange, like he's doing that, like that kind of thing. That's that, and it's not that fast. When they kick in with that, he's not using hybrid pick, he's using the pick to really kind of give it that punch and that bounce. So yeah. That kind of thing. It's his right hand keeping the time. Because you're going, if you're trying to chase it, like, or, like, where you just up, 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 up. If you're hearing this, one and two and three, let me slow it down.
Right, so it's all this. Keeping that going, that is the trick. And uh, practice, and just play, with, play the hip shake. Uh, Slim Harpo, shake your hips. Rolling Stones, same tune. Uh, LaGrange, uh, all the John Lee Hooker stuff too. Uh, Rick Beato is a great ear training course that he absolutely does. So go buy Rick Beato's ear training course. Um, oh, Graham Ross, I have a sliding six in one of my courses that's good for high breaking. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You should definitely get a gig in Europe. Bring me over. Everybody, a lot of people say that, man, you should play in Europe. Okay. <laughs> this is Matt Schofield and I talk about this all the time. Like, okay, make it so I can afford to do it and bring a band. It's always very, it's, it's a ton of work. Uh, I do play in Italy once a year, which uh, got canceled this year with my great friend, Hermano Bronifazzi. Um I'm just having fun with you on that. I would love to come over more. It just, it just financially, it becomes very, very difficult even apart from COVID, to be able to pay for the flights and the guys. And, you know, and, and to be, I'm just going to be really blunt. Like, if I could have all of you guys in one room at one time, that's great. But not having a big name, and it's very hard to play the music that I play and to really pack houses. It's really tough. So um, I'm working on it. So, yeah, next year I'll be back at the Umbria Blues Festival. I'm not sure we're going to have it uh, coming up with this. But it was... Um, Josh Smith and Ariel Posen and myself last year, and the year before it was David Grissom and Matt Schofield. So there's some good names, and we're, we're hankering to get that back up and running again. It'll be a ton of fun. Um, a lot of music. Uh, the, the boogie is a lot harder to, exercise, uh, to e execute excuse me, than it looks. It absolutely is, and it all is. It all is. Everything is harder than it looks if you want to play it really well. All right, so if you think about something like Billy, right, we're talking about that, just even like, you know, I'm working on the dynamics. I'm playing softer and louder that way. Um, sitting in a groove, I'm supposed to like. Yeah, Tina. You know, the time put into doing that stuff. So everything is is more difficult than it looks, which is great because because everybody could do it if not. And then, what's the fun in that? <laughs> um, which Billy Gibbons so
And I'm back. There we go. All right, there we go. I'm back. Thanks, guys. It's live. Cool. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, live is the best. I hadn't thought about changing. I just done a shoot, bunch of shooting for um, uh, five watt world and keys and a few other things. I didn't. I didn't check my batteries. Um, Okay, so, um, yeah, we're just blabbing. But thanks for everybody hanging. Any last questions? Um, I love that. Yeah, it's live. This is just so much fun. Uh, I, I do want to say once again, as always, I, I really appreciate everyone who comes here. Uh, it's a really, you know, it's going to, I don't curse much on the show, though I curse all the time in real life. It's a really shitty time for most people, myself included. You know what I mean? And uh, I really look forward to this every, every week. Uh, I feel like it's a great community that's slowly building and everybody's here and all the same people and we just kind of get together and hang out and talk about guitar. Um, I just want to make sure you guys know how much I really appreciate it. it. It takes my mind off of, you know, the monotony of what what things can be like right now, you know, um, and just the uncertainty and all these sort of things. So I really, I just want to say thanks to everybody who, who takes the time to uh, spend it with me uh, on Wednesday at 4 p.m. So thanks. And Phil Mingan being so supportive and all you guys. I just really, really appreciate it. Um, can I do a session where I discuss my latest album? Sure. I'm always happy to talk about myself. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I can do that. Um, yeah, absolutely. So let's, uh, once again, I just want to mention that, uh, and Phil has been pumping this up. All the courses, 25% off. I've got the tip jar. All the people who've been in the tip jar, I really appreciate that. Um, helps me continue to do this. And the True Fire courses certainly help me um, to continue doing this kind of stuff like that. And also, um, if you do get it to my website, it's 25% off. And I, I get a higher cut. The people at True Fire are the greatest people, but I get a, I get a higher cut. Um, so cool things coming up next week. Uh, we were thinking uh, Keith is launching a video on Beano on a Budget that he asked me so kindly to do, and we're going to talk about that. So that's the amp I used last week, which I think is, if you want that that sound, it's like a $400 amp is just the freaking coolest amp in the world for that money. I can't believe it. And I got to say, I will, I will admit it to live. I plugged in my super lead, which um, is running on two tubes. I just think it needs, it needs some 11. It's a great sounding amp, but um, I, th I plugged in the Origin. I was like, ah, actually, it sounds a little better right now than the Super Lead did, which is hysterical because, you know. Uh, hey, David. Thanks, man. Thanks for the, uh, uh, this is my first, <laughs> that pay, like, live five, la the first live chat stream. That's just a payment. Thank you, or a tip like that. Thanks, David. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, and then the, you know, the Bloomfield drive, it's, that's probably my favorite amp of all time at this point. Um, it's not inexpensive. So just, okay, just to top off last things, um, uh, what I'm using just to run over that, sorry, the Les Paul, and at some points I hit a drive. So here's the, the clean channel. It's, I say clean channel. Um, I'm using the Ox by Universal Audio, which is a really great unit. Um, I have I don't have it set for the clean sound. There's a lot of like tweaking that's involved in the unit, but it is great. So what I'm what I mean by that is if we, we just were to hear the amp live and I turned it on to the clean sound, it would sound cleaner. It's just it's about inputs and all these kind of things like that. Blah 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 blah. So <laughs> here is the overdrive channel, and I kind of dialed everything in for that. <laughs> glorious and then um, I have a boost on the floor which starts with a K and the reverb at the moment is uh, digital it's coming from the aux and I have a little bit of delay you can kind of hear it maybe um, let me turn it up here on the floor yeah, so it's kind of like bump, bump. So yeah, here's the amp on the dirty. 
There's a delay. Hold on. It's very touchy to get to that spot. There we go. And then I'm going to hit the clon. Now, just to show you, here's an overdrive pedal. It's a little darker right now, but tweak that here. And then the clown in front of you. Happy with that too. I got to sit there, you know, dialed in definitely much brighter on the, the two rock lead channel right now, but um, which origin do I have? I have the 20 watt combo with a 10 inch speaker. Uh, Marshall was cool enough to send it over for, for me and Keith to, to check out. And um, I'm going to, I'm going to keep it. It sounds great. I would probably venture to change the speaker. Okay. Uh, you know, Honestly, um, the speaker in the 112, the 110 combo, it sounds cool. It sounds really good, depending on what, you're, what you want to do. I plugged it into the True Rock 112, and I was like, wow, it sounds great. So um, definitely for sure. I would, uh, I, would, I would get the head and the 112 if I actually wanted to maybe gig with it much. Um, well, I think it would be nice about that amp since it's so small and light. Um, the 110 combo. Hold on. I'm going to walk off camera. Just to show you. Hold on. I mean, it's, you know, it's not that big. And it's, uh, if I can lift it up that easily, it's really light. So I think um, in terms of a practical thing, if you have like a small gig or you're going to go jam at somebody's house, that's a great size, really light amp. And it sounds really cool. And yeah, the combo is only like 500 bucks. Really cool. Really, really good. See? Look at the size of that. <laughs> I've seen the little delay on my video. And you heard it last week. If you want to check it out last week. Um, and it's all tube. Yeah, it's all, it's all tube. They just knocked it out of the park with this one. I was thinking about, um, like I said, I A-beat it with this. This needs a little love. But it was just, you know, uh, if you want to... It, it kind of gets maybe into an 800 Marshall, like 800 a little bit. It doesn't, it's not high gain, but I don't care about that. It gets a really great classic Marshall guitar tone. That's my, one of my favorite guitar tones. Um, and that's why I also uh, like this thing so much, though it's, it's a little more dumbly. I don't know. You know? Right? Sounds like Jimmy Page to me. And I can clean up, you know, really great with it. That Peter Green thing, you know. So I'm not going to go through a, a two rock. Look, I realize it, it's, a, it's a pricey proposition. But as a professional musician, um, it, it's made a great difference. So people, here's just, I'm just blabbing here because everybody's still hanging on and having fun. Or, t or you want me to just shut up. Is um, if you're going to make an investment, I would make an investment into a better amp than a better guitar right off the bat. So if you have like a, you know, a good Fender Strat, you know, or even like a good Mexican made, which are great guitars, like a, a, a moderately priced Stratocaster with good hardware. That's a big part of it. Like if you get a really, really cheap Strat, uh, you, you might want to eventually start changing the pickups. But say like, Phil, Phil, you got a great telly. And Jason Lachlan, a good friend of mine, helped to, um, to uh, steer him in a direction because Jason's a big telly guy. If you get those twisted telly pickups um, and you get the... Um, the uh, uh, the, the right hardware, because these ones use the cheaper hardware, it stinks. So, you know, everybody's money is different. But my point is, you can get, say if you buy like a five or $600 guitar, you'd want to spend more money on the amp. Because um, the if you're playing a great guitar through a crappy amp, it's going to sound crappy. 
if you're playing a good guitar through a really great amp, it's going to sound really good. And that's when, when you step up to an even better guitar that you might start to hear the difference more. So that's people, I've had a lot of students like, I bought this guitar and I bought this little cheapo practice Fender amp. And you're like, should have gone the other way. You know, that's, that's to me is super important. A, a good sounding amplifier. Um, what will I replace the speaker in the origin with? I don't know. Um, I don't want to start getting into a 112 baffle with that because then you got to take it out. And I just, you know, I like that it's light. Um, if I could fit a 112 in there, I would just keep it in there. I think uh, reading up, it's kind of difficult to do. So I would probably choose, um, I'm gonna look at if they have a G12 H65 in a 10 inch. That would be cool because this is, those are the speakers I like. And that's the kind of the two rock speakers based upon that. And it's got some headroom, you know. Um, if you put like a cream back or like a, a green back, a 25 watt speaker, it might not have the headroom and it might store it earlier. So if you're using a really low wattage amp like 20 watts, I would usually go for a more efficient speaker because the amp's got a master volume on it. So um, that would be most, that would, what I would do. And there's a 112 version, yeah, bro said the 112 version, 100 watts, uh, 50 watts. Yeah. Um, I, I've got that neighborhood covered, right? You know what I'm saying? I've got 50, this is a 40 watt Bloomfield, which is loud as all get out, um, 100 watt and a 100 watt Marshall. So I, I wanted something in the lower wattage range. And um, there you go. Uh, you have tried the Boss Katana? I have a Boss Katana. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, so let me get that. And, and the, the origins have a, uh, a, a wattage cut from down to like 5 watts to 0.5 watts. And it gets really saturated, and it gets that really great Bino tone, which is what I'm always after through a Les Paul, like that, through a Marshall, through a Les Paul. Somebody asked, how does the Origin sounds great with a Strat, too? It's just a great sounding amp. I'm totally, you know, what it kind of lacks in for me, and, and not all Marshalls do, um, is a great clean tone. But I'm not buying um, a Marshall all the time for a great clean tone. That being said, like a, Super bass gets a great clean tone. But if I'm looking for a great clean tone, I'm going to use the T-Rock or, or the Fender Princeton, you know, something that's known for the clean tone. If you want to get sort of the broken up thing that the Marshalls do the best, it does that really great. Now, it can get a clean tone, and it's... I should get a kickback from those guys. Jeez. <laughs> and it's got an effects loop that you can turn on and off, and it's got a boost. So, um, you know, so that's kind of cool, you know. Um, so I'm getting phone calls. Um, yeah, so I'm going to look into the speaker for that because that'd be kind of fun. Um, and those Joyo things, yeah, there's there's all sorts of great bargain things out there now. But as my point at the beginning was, a, a good tube amp is going to get you more mileage than the equal equivalent of a good guitar. So it maybe spend a little less on the guitar and more on the amp if you're looking to kind of keep things on a bit of a budget. That being said, you know, when we grew up, or when I'm just judging that a lot of you guys, from my demographic, or we're all in the same general age group, a cheap guitar was terrible. Like, terrible when we were growing up, right? Just terrible, horrible, horrible. And then, um, you know, with, with CNC routing and computer, all that stuff, the inexpensive guitars are still pretty good because they don't, they computer cut it's not this horrible unplayable thing it's usually the usually where they cut the corner is the quality of the wood like the cheaper fender might use a poplar body um and then uh all the uh hardware pickups etc okay the bus katana i do have a bus katana and i had that um for gigs like sometimes i would do you know parties you know like where you kind of background music which is kind of fun i always pay pretty well and, you know, I didn't want to lug something like this, so I'd just bring the katana. I'd go on the subway, show up, or just drive to the gig. Weighs nothing. It's loud. Nice, loud, clean tone. So, and they sound pretty good. My only thing that I do with the katana when I use it, and I think they're great amps, um, and you guys check out this great Irish guitar player, Anto Drennan. A-N-T-O-D-R-E-N-N-A-N. He plays with um, Mike... Uh, from Genesis, Mike and Mechanics, Mike... I just suddenly forgot his name. Mike and the Mechanics. He plays with them. And um, 
he gets some of the coolest sounds out of Catan. He uses it on, on the road. So Anto Drennan, A-N-T-O-D-R-E-N-N-A-N, Irish guitar player who is really great. And the only thing I use when I'm using a katana is I, I sometimes put a little clean boost in front of it. I've got the, like a vertex boost or, or a spark where I think it just gives it a little more, little more life that um, most solid state amps to me are missing uh, and tube amps have. So just a little more, Mike Rutherford, thank you so much. It's a little more pop to the note. So that's why I would use a clean boost just to kind of warm it up and make it feel better. Thanks guys. Okay. so. Um, yeah, we're running late, running late today, so I want to say thanks so much because everybody's hanging in there. Lots of people on right now. I really appreciate it once again, like I said. Um, if you want to help out, and this is how I make my living, uh, you know, course is 25% off. I got the Billy Gibbons course, so that's why you came in here too. Billy Gibbons, uh, playing the style of Billy Gibbons, go in, into depth on that. Um, and, um, yeah, thanks so much to Phil Mingan. Thanks to everyone who is here. Uh, and uh, if you... If you're, oh, do me a favor, if you're new in all this uh, to me, please subscribe. Oh, that would be great. And also follow me on Instagram if you want. Um, just then I post things over there and everything is trying to keep everything moving forward. So everybody have a great weekend. I will, s a great weekend, a great week. I will see you in a week from now. Uh, same time uh, and all that. So take care, everybody. See you guys later. Thanks.